What happened to the rest of you? <laughs> Just kidding. You remember last week I could not find my notes. I'm running around like a headless chicken trying to find my notes. Found them. <laughs> I don't know. Right here, I have probably the greatest sermon ever written this side of the moon, but I'm not going to do it. And you can thank Shirley for that. Shirley, uh, Friday night, taught at uh, EGS. And I went home and I was thinking about some things she said. I can hear myself breathing. I don't like that. It grosses me out. Um, and last night I laid in bed running this through my head. And I really feel that's what I need to do today. And so I really don't even have any notes. In fact, I don't even know that I got a scripture. Shirley said that we, were, that we were talking about being on a journey, that we're all on a journey. And this is exactly true. Every single one of us that have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior is, in fact, on a journey. And in that journey, the Lord wants to teach and to train us for what He has for us to do. And you've heard this time and time again, that each one of us has a call, each one of us has a destiny on our life. But you do not start at square one and end up at your destiny without training and preparation. And sometimes that training and that preparation and those people that, that the Lord brings into your life is not easy. It's not easy, but it's vitally important. I want to share with you, and I, I've never, I don't think I have, uh, some of you have heard my testimony or some of my testimony, and I want to share with you my testimony today. And how that impacted my life. In fact, I'll tell you this. I would not be standing right here today if it wasn't for the Lord with a divine appointment for me. Now, I went to church all my life. I, I, don't, I don't recall a time that we didn't go to church. Uh, we went to the first Christian church, and it was one of those churches, you know, you, you sing two songs, and on the third stanza, everyone stands up, and you can't turn around and look at the person behind you, and, and no one dare raise your hand, and you never heard the word Holy Spirit mentioned at all. And he would get up, and he would preach for 20 minutes and give a poem, and, and you knew that when he walked down the aisle to the door that it was exactly 1130, I mean, on the dot. You could set your watch by him. That's, that's the church we went to. And I learned in Sunday school about Noah's Ark and David and Goliath and, and the basics, and that was all good. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But yet when I left home, uh, I went out in the world and I did my own thing. When me and Peg got, first got married, I wasn't going to church, didn't want to go to church. Oh, we talked about church, but it wasn't an issue in my life. I still believed in Jesus. I don't know. I can't even remember a time that I didn't believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But yet, I wasn't serving. I wasn't walking. And I certainly wasn't going to church. In 1975, uh, I got on to Richland County Sheriff's Department as a jailer. In 1976, I went out on the road as a deputy. In 1978, I got a call one night. I was 
on patrol and got a call of a domestic with the janitor of our courthouse. His wife called and said there was a fight going on at their house. Now, I knew we called him Red because he had red hair. And uh, we called him Red, and I knew Red was an alcoholic. And so I figured he was drunk, and, you know, here we go. And so I responded to their house, pulled up in the driveway, lived out in the country, lived in a trailer, and had a lane that went up to the trailer. And I pulled in the lane, not thinking anything about it. And his wife and his daughter are standing out at the edge, at the end of the trailer outside, and they were holding each other crying. I get out of the car, and as I'm walking toward them, of course, they called, I'm going to go talk to them. And as I'm walking up there, I get to the end of my car, and I cannot go any further. I literally cannot go past the end of my car. And, I, and to this day, I remember how odd that was that I'm looking at them and they're looking at me and I'm not going up there to talk to them. And just at that time, Red comes into the door of the trailer with a pistol in his hand. And I said, Red, put down that gun. I want to talk to you. He goes, we don't have anything to talk about. And he pulls up and fires at me. And I fall down behind my car. And in my mind, I'm thinking, he doesn't think I'm going to arrest him. I'm going to charge him with everything in the book. I've never, you know, the idea of drawing my gun hadn't even entered my mind yet. And I look up through, the, my door's open, and I look up through the windshield of my car, and every time I look up, he points the gun at me. So I stay down. I get on the radio, call, emergency shots fired, officer needs assistance, yada, yada. Troops are on the way. I stay behind my car, and I'm thinking, as long as I stay behind this car, he can't shoot through it. And so I'm standing there, and every time I peek up to see where he's at, he points the gun at me. Now I realize it's starting to get serious. Other deputies start arriving, state police arrive, and they're out in the road behind me because I'm out here in no man's land between hiding behind my car because Red's got a gun shooting at me. They decide they're going to move a car up behind me so I can fall back and get back. Well, as they're moving around back there, he comes out and he starts shooting at them. And I can't let that happen. To make a long story short, I shot and I killed the janitor of our courthouse. But see, not only was he... Government. <clears throat> Not only was he the janitor of our courthouse, he was the husband of the lady that called, and he was the father of the little girl that was standing out there. What I did was right according to the law of the state of Illinois. But the question in my head what did God think about that? I didn't know zip about Scripture at the time. And the only thing that I could think of was thou shalt not kill. And I just killed. Crime scene technicians come in. State police detectives come in. They take my weapon, send it off the crime lab. They take me in the office. They read me my rights. And I'm thinking, did I do everything right? Because I can see my whole life going to prison because of some little thing that I'd done wrong. And so I'm running all this through my head, and, 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 and everything in my mind says I was right in doing what I did legally. The coroner's inquest had come back that it was justifiable homicide. I was clear what I did was right. But still in here, I had that question. What does God say about that? What does he think? So I went to a preacher. 
and I asked him, I, I, I explained the situation to him, and, and he said, well, Richard, if it's a sin, God can forgive you of that sin. Now, that's true. But there was no truth in that for me. That didn't help me, none. Because if what I did was a sin, then how can I justify what my job is in doing against what God says? And that, that just made the situation worse. A couple of months after that, I got a call to the high school at Noble some problem. After I was done, I went to the principal's office, and I was talking to the, the principal. His name was Harold Ash. He said, Richard, how are you doing on that uh, shooting thing? I said, oh, okay. I'm trying to be tough. Yeah, I can handle it. And inside, it was just a turmoil. He said, let me show you something. I understand this is the principal of a high school. And he reaches in his desk and he pulls out a Bible. He opens it to Romans chapter 13. And he reads this to me. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God, the powers that are ordained of God. In other words, those powers, this is the government that is established. It is established of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power or the government, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist will receive unto themselves damnation or condemnation. doesn't mean they're going to hell. It is a condemnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Will thou not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and you will have praise of the same. Not necessarily today, but... For he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he bears not the sword in vain. Revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. And he said, Richard, what you did is ordained of God. That was like when he said those words to me. It was like being totally in a smoke-filled room to where you can't breathe and stepping out into a room that is a pure oxygen atmosphere. I felt the world lift off my shoulders. And I had him repeat that to me again. He said, you don't bear the sword in vain. See, back then they carried a sword. Today we carry firearms. When I left the high school, going back to the office, I told the Lord, If I ever get the chance, to do to someone what was just done to me, I want to do it just one time. just once. As the years went on, I started going to church. And people started coming into my life and speaking things into my life. And they said, Richard, I think you ought to be a deacon of the church. I didn't ask for it. I said, okay. Before long, someone says, I think you need to be an elder of the church. 
after that, they said, we want you to go to ministerial internship program, get licensed as a minister. I did that, became a youth pastor. Then I became an assistant pastor. Now I are a pastor. And I never asked for any one of those, not for one. In fact, I swore one time that I'd never be a pastor. Don't ever do that. And you say, well, Richard, what, what significance does that have? Well, I had questions in my heart as to what was right and what was wrong. I went to a preacher who should have known, and he said, if it's a sin, God can forgive you of that sin. Now, how many of you know that is true? That is true. But it had no truth for me. But yet, the principal of a high school took the Word of God, connected it with the Spirit of God, and it became alive inside of me, and it became truth. And that truth set me free from what I was going through. We can know the Word, and we know that the Word what says right here, this, that's true. It does say that. But is there truth in it for you? It's that truth that sets us free. When the Spirit and the Word come together and make it real for you, it sets you free. After I was a minister for a while, I started going to different churches and preaching to different churches. I was over in a church in Indiana and uh, had my message, and I was in the middle of this message, and it was a good message. <laughs> I don't even know what it was. And I'm in the middle of this message, and the Holy Spirit says, give your testimony. And I don't even have anything to do with what I'm saying. So I went on with my message, because I know more than the Holy Spirit does. And the Holy Spirit says again, Give your testimony. I mean, I, you could feel give your testimony. I said, I, wanna, I don't know, this doesn't have anything to do with what I'm doing, but I want to give you my testimony. So I shared with you or with them what I just shared with you. And while I'm sharing it, on the back row, on the end of the back row, there's a man back there and tears are rolling down his face. So I went ahead with my message, gave my testimony, went ahead with my message, and I had an altar call, and several people come forward. I'm praying with them, you know, and I noticed this man standing over here. I get through praying for people, and, and I look over, and he comes over to me and says, can I talk with you over here? I said, absolutely. And I go over there, and tears rolling down his face, and he says, he was a sniper over in uh, Desert Storm. And I can't remember, it was either 12 or 24, I how many confirmed kills he had. And he says, I still see their face in that scope. He says, I can still see. And he says, I've been to psychiatrist, psychologist. I've been on drugs and psychotherapy and, and institutions and, and counseling. He said, I've done all this. He said, but what you did, what you said here today, set me free from that. He said, it's done more than all of that put together. And we both stood there, cried, and hugged. And on the way back home, I remember what I said to the Lord. If I can do one person what was done to me. And he had let me do that. See, what he did to me that day, he downloaded on the inside of me a desire, a desire so strong to see people set free by this word right here. If it wasn't for that situation, now then, did, did God 
cause Red to die? No, that was a choice on his part. That was a choice he made. But God did orchestrate me being there. And by not allowing me to pass the front of my vehicle tells me that even while I was not living for the Lord, his hand was still on me. Now, the rest of that story is though I was cleared, everything I did was right. It was justifiable. His wife worked out at the hospital in uh, housekeeping. And some months after that, I got a call to the hospital. The psych unit needed assistance. I get to the the hospital and I'm waiting on the elevator and the doors open up and there stood Ruth that was his wife and if I could have melted into the floor I would have and I didn't know whether to run <laughs> I didn't know what to do and I just stood there and I looked at her and she said Richard I want to talk to you and my heart was just stopped. And she said, I want to apologize to you. And I said, apologize to me? She said, I'm sorry for what happened that night. And I said, I am too. So we stood there in the elevator door and we hugged and we cried. And the elevator doors were clanking on us. But even that part of my life that was still undone, God brought closure to that in a perfect way. There was no part of that that God didn't have his finger in all the way through. So I learned the difference between true and truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say, I'm true. He said, I am truth. And that desire in me to get this word to somebody else is so strong, and I know that it was initiated that day because I saw firsthand what this word can do. Just the right word spoken at the right time can set somebody free. How many people in here are in full-time ministry? Raise your hand. How many people have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior? Raise your hand. Now, how many people are in full-time ministry? Raise your hand. That's every single one of you. Every single one of you. And on this journey, there may be times that people, events, places the Lord will take you, put people in your life. Sometimes it may be hard that was a hard time in my life. That was a turning point in my life that I can't begin to express. But it was needed for me to get me where he wanted me to be. Each one of you, may we're all on a journey, as Shirley said the other night. We're all on a journey. But to get us from point A to point B to point C, he's going to put people in your lives he may put events in your lives that at that particular time you may not notice what God's doing, but He is working in your life. Look for what God is doing. Embrace what God is doing. We said earlier that, that we have an inheritance, and I think what 
Donna said was right on cue and for a perfect time because we do have an inheritance. Everything Jesus has, we have. But then the Bible also says, for whom much is given, much is required. We've been given everything. I would say there's a lot required of us. Romans 13 says that we need to obey the law of the land. But there's coming a day, and I think it's coming soon, in which laws are going to be implemented and enforced against the church. And whenever the law of the land gets to a point where it violates the law of God, we have to make a choice. And you better make the right choice because we have to obey the laws of God. I want you to understand something. When Daniel, Daniel was ordered to stop praying. He could not pray. But Daniel went ahead and prayed. Now understand, I want you to get this in your head. He violated the law that was given that says, don't pray. But he accepted the punishment that came with that law. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was told that when the music was to play, they were to bow down to the image that Nebuchadnezzar made. When the music played, they said, no, we will not bow down to that. We only bow down to God himself. They violated the law of the land, but they accepted the punishment. They said, throw us in the oven. We don't care. We're not bowing down. Whatever you're going to do, you're going to do. And if God lets us die, then God lets us die. But if he protects us, then he will protect us. And they threw him in the fiery furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar himself looked in there and said, did we not throw three people in there? Lo, I see four people walking around unbound and unharmed, and they came out of that fiery furnace unscathed. God protects his people. God protects his people. And there's coming a day in which laws are going to be enacted that we're going to have to violate. We may have to go to prison because of this book. Or maybe even worse. I don't know. But there's laws they're trying right now to outlaw the Bible. There's all kinds of crazy stuff going on. I watched a YouTube video the other night. It was called Europeans Prove the Bible Wrong or something. I don't know. European something. And there was this panel of people, PhDs, doctors. And they were up there, and the, the, the guy asked his first lady who had a PhD and was a professor at some university, whatever, and said, so you're saying that the Bible's not even a historical book? No, no, there's nothing in history that shows that the Bible's even true. He said, so Noah's Ark and, and Moses don't even exist. No, they don't exist, and there's no record of them existing at all. And then it comes on the screen. She's telling the truth and has some stuff down here to read, you know. And this, they had a bishop of some church. I don't know what church. And he said, well, it does have, there has been archaeological finds and all that, and it comes on big letters flashing on the screen. He is lying. He is lying. And the whole thing was de saying this was not even historically accurate. See, the thing is, people will buy that. That, there's people going to fall in line with this. There's lines going to be drawn in the sand from Christians and non-Christians, and there's going to be laws that are going to be passed 
It says you can't preach, you can't do this. In the military, they used to hand out Bibles, three different types of Bibles. They had the, the Catholic, the Protestant, and the Jewish Bibles, and they had stuff on the inside. said you can find comfort on the inside. Now then it's illegal, but they still hand out Korans. That ought to give you a hint of what's going on. We're all on a journey. God's going to take you where he wants you to go. You have a choice. I have a choice. Can I tell you, can I tell you that there have been times I've wanted to quit? Can I tell you maybe many times I've wanted to quit? But I laid in bed the other night after listening to Shirley. There's no way we can quit. Absolutely no way we can quit. We have got to keep pushing forward. There is no neutral. You're either going backwards or you're going forwards. There's no neutral. It's either black or it's white. There's no fence riding. And we need to get it in this word. We need to get on our knees in prayer. And if we expect the election or the government to solve this nation's problems, we're wrong. You're putting your eggs in the wrong basket. Chronicles says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and heal their land. Now listen to what that said. He didn't say if the world would quit doing it. He said if my people, if my people would humble themselves and pray, seek his face, turn from their wicked ways. The reason this country's in the shape it's in, it's not because of the sin that's in the world, it's because of the sin that's in the church. If we turn from our wicked ways, then he will hear from heaven and heal our land. Ouch. I've said all that just to say, I love this church. It's the best church that I've ever been in, and I say that honestly. And I've been in several. We have got the best people that want to do the most work that I've ever seen in any church. That's not because I'm pastor. That's because Ray and Don, Greg, the elders, years ago laid that foundation. And we need to continue to grow it. We need to continue to push forward. We need to continue to do our Father's work. And that's what we're here for. That's what we're here for. It's not about who's up on stage or who gets glory or anything else. It's about us doing what we're called to do, being where we're supposed to be, doing what we're supposed to be doing. And he said, that's good. This church is good. We've got so much stuff going on here. And there's people that are rising up, coming up to the surface. Expect, expect people to come into your life, problems to rise up, events in your, in your face. They're there. Remember, God will teach you and show you something in that. Look for it. I didn't look for it. But later, going back, I see God's hand all through it. And if it wasn't for that event, I would not be here today. What he has placed in me was because of that one event. And I have got to continue that to grow. That's why I love this word. I love it. I love him because he's so smart. And we've got to fall in love with him over and over and over again and get in this word, fall on our knees and pray. That's where the power is, not in the government, not in our education. Let him do what he wants to do in your life. 
Let him raise you up and be what he wants you to be. That's what you're designed for. That's what you're designed for. Let's stand. Maybe someday I'll get to this greatest sermon that's ever been written. Deborah drew a picture. I would say a warrior with a sword and dry bones, and it says, dry bones arise. I think that's the word for the church today, arise, arise, who we're supposed to be. Fill that spot. Take the hand of the person next to you and just pray for each other. I mean really pray for each other. Father, we just come to you right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for, I thank you for each person that's here today, Lord God. I just ask a blessing upon each person that you touch them. Meet their needs, Lord. But Father, you have given each one of us a destiny. You have a call on each one of our lives. And Father, I just ask right now, by your spirit, by your word, that you just raise them up. Let them have those divine appointments with whoever, with whatever. Teach them, Lord God, what you want them to know. Let them see your truth. Let us fall in love with your son, Jesus, and with your word, Lord God. Lord, we just love you. We praise you, and I thank you for everything that you've done in our lives. For everything that you have done is there for a reason, to teach us, to bring us to a truth, Lord. Let us see and understand that truth. Let us see you more and more. Change us, mold us, and shape us into the image of your Son, Jesus, Lord. Father, we just give you praise your angels go before us and behind us. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, I heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like. But I heard the tender whisper of love. In the dead of night, you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father.